Game week. Week one. Locked game week. And what are we talking about, dude? Game, game week was last week. week. We will get game to week the, was last week. We will get to the Let's Roddy go. Jones victory lap here in a little bit. Okay, I promise, because we got a lot to talk to. Trip Hurd is with us as well. Proud Florida State. Seminole football fan, Duke basketball fan. He's ready to get the Cooper flag new balances in a couple of months. We'll talk to Trip all about that in a little bit. Of course, you've already heard Roddy Jones. He's fired up. He's got the Georgia Tech hat on if you're watching on YouTube. We got a lot to get to today, boys. I'm so excited for this week. A couple of programming notes, okay? We got a full show, a lot to get to. John Height is going to join us in about 45 minutes. He works at the Roar, which is the Clemson flagship station. It'll be the height of the show. 5.5 FM. Very good, Roddy. Very good. We're going to do a deep dive on Clemson and Georgia hooking up in Atlanta at the Benz. Uh, that is the high noon game uh, Eastern time for those of you that uh that are that are curious for when these things kick i think it's like the aflac kickoff or something anyway it's at the bends yeah, you better Georgia, put some respect on the aflac the chick-fil-a bowl people do a great job with that game title sponsor aflac aflac kickoff baby spoken like a guy who has spent his entire state or his entire life in the state of georgia i i do want to plug something before we get going for those that don't know about the varsity app okay the varsity app is a place that what do you, you have can go what do you have to listen to live college football games and podcasts from your favorite team if you're out of market if you want to listen to the first ever kalen DeBoer coaches show when he takes over in tuscaloosa this week you can listen to that for free on the app so users can search for their school they can access specific content it's all free apple store google play whatever type of device you have so check out the varsity app and you can also listen to the blitz which roddy we are firing up on thursday for uh, for like a little digital stream only production from seven mm. to midnight. Of course, on Saturday it's noon to midnight. It's twelve hours. If you don't know what the blitz is, step your game up. It's college football red zone for radio, and we have a great time. Trip does an awesome job running the board and having to put up with my ass for six hours every Saturday. Okay, let's get into it. Roddy Jones, the victory lap continues, buddy. How has life been since about three o'clock on Saturday afternoon for you, my man? Uh, look, life is the same, man. Like, is it though? you know, there's still it's kids to be same. fed. There's still minivans to drive. There's still, you know, work to be done. Um, but, but I, I think for, for Georgia tech fans, like the hope is it now springs, maybe not eternal, but, but it springs for now, uh, because there's no reason that Georgia tech shouldn't be considered a contender in this league after beating Florida state, especially the way they did. Everyone has talked about the fact that Georgia Tech dominated on the trenches, which is true. And I don't want to skate over that. Like, I don't want to downplay that at all. But the thing that's more impressive to me is that Georgia Tech was able to win this game despite Florida State really getting all the breaks. And I'm not saying that disparagingly. Like, in every game, there are moments and there are things that happen that are sort of outside the realm of of, of normal. Like, they are not things that you can count on happening on a week-in, week-out basis a timely face mask penalty yes. because your quarterback ducks down and the guy's hand is coming over the top and just grabs the bottom of the face mask. Very fluky. Continue to drive that Florida State scored on. Two 50-plus yard field goals hit by your kicker. Kind of fluky. Like, I mean, your kicker could be very good and be 60% from 50-plus. So, like, the fact that Florida State hit two bombs of a field goal – they probably feel like they can count on that more often than not. But like, those are things in a college football game that when they go your way, you typically win. Uh, and Florida state didn't Georgia tech won the game. So, so I give a ton of credit to Georgia tech. Um, I give a ton of credit to Brent key, Buster Faulkner, Tyler Santucci, the uh, head coach, offensive, defensive coordinators, respectively. Them boys, uh, a, them, yeah, boys. them boys, uh, give a ton of credit to Haynes King and Jamal Haynes. The, 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 jeopardy before and after answer of my favorite question who are the running back and the quarterback for georgia tech jamal haynes king uh i, I give a ton of credit to that defense defensive front kyle leaford's now a a viral meme because of his neck roll but he played really well so um it's been great for georgia tech fans because uh you had the stage the build up the wonderful thing about winning this game is is we talked about it for weeks leading up to it so georgia tech got that spotlight then you go out and you win the game and it's the only game we have to talk about this week. 
until we flip, turn the page to, to to previewing, but like you can't preview for five days. Like that's just exhausting. So you review and you preview, and Georgia Tech kind of gets the stage to itself and all that. So so it's been it's been wonderful for Tech there. Trip, how has your life changed since Saturday afternoon around three o'clock Eastern time? Well, I, I mean, it hasn't changed. I I don't know how many times I've got to come on these shows and tell you guys exactly what's going to happen in a football game. But I basically did it again with this one. I told you it was a toss up. It was a field goal game last week. And the surprising thing for me, I was surprised that it looked like FSU got pushed around when I thought it would be vice versa. And the other thing, especially in the second half, it just looked like Georgia tech was getting their guys open. Like Haynes King had guys he could throw it to. DJ didn't look like he had guys getting open for him. So, uh, yeah, not not a great day for FSU. Let, let, let me spin it this way, Roddy, because obviously Georgia Tech's gotten a lot of attention, and, and rightfully so, right? They, they won a game as a double-digit underdog in a neutral venue that was anything but neutral, man. That place was what? Felt like 70% Florida State fan. I wasn't there, Roddy, but on TV, man, a lot of garnet and gold at Aviva yeah. Stadium. Let me spin it this way for you. You want to buy Florida State stock now at 0-1? Do you want to sell it, or do you want to hold on to this thing? Because, obviously, there's still a lot of football left to be played. Just because you lost doesn't mean you're out of a 12-team playoff. It's a conference loss. You'd rather not have it. But how would you evaluate, like, where Florida State goes from here? They got Boston College coming to Tallahassee on Monday. I, I am not buying Florida State stock. Um, I thought this Florida State team would take a step back for a number of reasons. Tripp just mentioned one of them. I did not think at, at the key positions, the key skill positions on offense, they had improved. Like, you can't tell me that. Re- well, coming in, like I said, it, you, you can't tell me that they're better at receiver. You could tell me that they may be more productive at receiver, but that means manufacturing some stuff, and mostly because Johnny Wilson – and, and Keon Coma were banged up for a lot of last year. Their production didn't necessarily match at all times where they were drafted. So you could have convinced me that they were going to be more productive at receiver. Um, I knew they weren't going to be as as explosive at running back, and they're not. Roydo Williams was actually pretty good in the game, but they're not going to be as explosive at running back, which makes their margin for error much smaller because you have to drive down the field. And like, as much as we talk about the offseason, and dude, I say this all the time. We don't do pro- we don't do podcasts in the offseason. We need to, because I say it in the offseason a lot. You can catch Roddy, it on you get, you, get, you get plenty of airtime in the offseason, dog. I love you. I know, but I don't get to talk to you. Uh like when we have seen guys in the transfer portal, the guy you're getting is the guy he's been. DJ Uyungle Lake is getting a lot of flack for this game. And I disagree with that. Like, I am, we should not be putting this loss on DJ. Like, we should not be hammering DJ because of what he's doing or, or because of the way he played. He played exactly like he's played the last three years. Yeah. Like, good point. He, he is what he is, man. He's not going to win you a game. He needs people around, like Tripp said, like, he needs people around him to make plays. And he needs, he needs some, he needs some, I don't know if it's confidence instilled in him. Whatever Jonathan Smith did at Oregon State, he needs some of that, you know? Because I thought Mike Norvell was really conservative with the pass play calls. And and I can understand why it lasted so long because it was a low possession game. And when you have an idea of getting a guy into it and getting him in rhythm, it's hard when you don't have the ball a lot. But, like there were really two downfield shots. One was a deep crosser that he, that he missed. And the other one was a deep shot down the field that he threw out of bounds. So, so maybe that, maybe that's, you know, sort of what Mike Norvell was thinking like, Hey, we missed a couple of these, but, but I thought there should have been more of that, especially with Georgia tech blitzing as much as they did in the second half. Um, But like the failure of Florida state on offense was the offensive line, was what they were last year and i'll get to that in a second but the receiving core and the running backs weren't as good the running backs were close but they weren't as explosive as trey benson and lawrence toafili got loose the one time but after that it was it wasn't much and the receivers weren't weren't as good they just weren't um and then the offensive line part of it this offensive line was not the best offensive line in the league last year it was an offensive line that was good running the ball, and then had some issues in pass pro. Jordan Travis covered up those issues, and we forgot that because Jordan Travis could move. Not only could he move to run, which he didn't do a ton, 
but he can move in the pocket to create throwing lanes. DJ's not going to do that. So when the pocket collapses or when these guys get beat quickly, which happened a few times against Georgia Tech in, again, a low possession game, like they're, they're probably, you know, five or six examples where it happens. DJ's not going to create in the same way that Jordan Travis did. So, so no, you can't buy Florida State. You hold them at best and probably sell, to be honest with you. Not a ton. They'll still be in the running in the ACC. But those issues, you look at the teams on the schedule, there's going to be other teams that give them issues unless they get that stuff corrected like today. And then there's another Florida State point I want to make later, but I've talked for too long already. No, I, I think it's great. Like uh, Everyone wants to overreact and, and, and we talked about this last week, Roddy. Georgia Tech, Florida State, it's going to get a lot of attention. It's going to get a lot of eyeballs. This is unfamiliar territory for Georgia Tech. They go out and win the game. So now everybody's you know heaping praise, and rightfully so, on Brent Key and company and, and what they've been able to do. What is it, six wins over ranked teams? Like That's impressive stuff for a guy who took over as an interim head coach uh, You know when Jeff Collins had this program really kind of in the dumpster. So, look, that, that these are all good things for Georgia Tech, Florida State. We'll see how it goes. We're going to do this next week, too. I mean, we're going to be overreacting to what we saw with all these week one games, right? So I'm here yeah. for it. I think it's I think it's good content. So go I, ahead. I, I, continue. I don't I don't I don't think I feel like I'm I'm trying not to overreact on Florida State. It's either confirmation or or dis, confirmation of things that you thought or sort of um you know maybe starting to change opinions slightly. Uh but all of my biggest fears for Florida State came true in that game. The defensive line I thought would be good. That one I don't want to overreact too much to because I think that was a lot of first game stuff. There were a lot of stuff. There was a lot of stuff where um, guys weren't on the same page. I will say, uh, Braden Fisk was a penetrator on defense. Like Braden Fisk was a guy who could get upfield and disrupt in the backfield. The two guys that they've got in the middle are stout. They weren't as stout as they should have been, but they are stout. But they're not penetrators. They're not quick. They are heavy bodies that just sit there and take up space. That could be an issue for Florida State long term. Um, the Marvin Jones thing, like. He's got a long way to go to be close to Jared Verse. That could be an issue for Florida State. And, and you know, again, I don't want to overreact. Guys can get better. But, like, the pass rush, he had one good spin move inside. The rest of the plan was not there. So, so we've got a little ways to go. I thought Patrick Payton's, you know, was was uh, less than stellar in, in the run game. The, the point that I wanted to make earlier, again, that, I, that was sort of a fear of the offseason. The Florida State team that went 13-0 and last year had a nucleus of players that had been through shared ad adverse experiences. The nucleus of that team, particularly the quarterback, but guys around him, you know, Johnny Wilson had been there for a few years. He had jumped in during the 10-win 10 10 win season, but, but he had been there for a few years. Trey Benson had been there for a few years. Jared Verse had been there for a few years. Tatum Bethune had been there for a few years. But then there's this nucleus of guys – like a Jordan Travis, like some of these offensive linemen that had gone five and seven with a loss at home to Jacksonville State. To, to, so, like, when you have that, that propels you in a work from a work standpoint, but also from a mentality standpoint of like things that you've been through. This nucleus has not been through that. And it looked like a team that didn't know how Florida State is supposed to play. It looked like a team that didn't know like what the culture of Florida State is, the, the attitude that you're supposed to play with. And, and to be quite honest, it looked like a team at the beginning of Mike Norvell's tenure rather than the team that he had sort of grown for the three years prior to them going 13-0. Trip, here's the good news, man. Cooper Flag signed a deal with New Balance. They, they put a commercial out on Twitter. You got Duke Exhibition Basketball starting up in early October. I mean, like, you're going to be fine, dude. Don't, like, you're fine. I wore my new balances yesterday. Um, yeah, I'm going to be fine. But if if you're talking stocks right now, I would definitely sell Florida State stock in time for this coming weekend. Because normally, I think people would jump on Florida State at this point because they're going back home. They're getting another game that they're supposed to win. They're favored by 16 and a half, but... I'm going the other way here. I I like BC plus the points this Ooh. coming weekend, but Florida State Florida State was special last year. That was a special group of guys. That's why 10 of them are going to be playing 
not this Sunday, but the next one. Like it, it was just completely unrealistic to think that this year's team was going to be able to fill those shoes. I mean, I don't, I don't understand why we thought that this group of receivers, when they're completely unknown, could replace Keon Coleman, who was what two picks away from being a first round pick. One pick. It's the first pick of the second round. The, yeah. The, 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 I completely agree with you, Trip. The other thing is like Florida State won those games last year. The game that they just played, they won those games last year. They they went to overtime multiple times. Like it's not like they blew everybody out. You know, they were played a close game of Boston College on the road Boston that they College. ended up winning. Like that and, and the difference in that to me is is one individual talented players, but two a share like a belief yeah. as a team that we're not gonna win the, we're not gonna lose this game. I I don't see that. Well, let me say I did not see that against Georgia Tech for this team. The defense was supposed to be the thing that we were sure about. And Georgia Tech had a almost seven minute drive to kill the game. How about that? Kill the game. Death Got the ball yeah. six minutes and thirty something seconds left, and Florida State never saw the ball again. And then at the very end, like you catch a, like you said, they did catch all the breaks. Like Georgia Tech didn't. Uh, Haynes he fumbled the snap. Fumbled like the snap the to go, knock him out of field goal range. To knock him out, of, and then you give up what a thirteen yard like a, play on a on a screen pass, like. And, and look, I want to give a lot of credit to Georgia Tech. We, I, I've tried to make a point to give a lot of credit to Georgia Tech for what they did. Like the scheme on that screen pass was great. The guy missed the tackle. You know, uh, Eric Singleton Jr. is up, but the leverage, leverage for Florida State, that's bad leverage. You got to get out there. You have to be able to tackle. You, you, the, the, the linebacker who comes out to try to tackle EJ Singleton takes a terrible, terrible angle. You have to pursue. Like if he's going to beat you, let him beat you inside. Don't let him beat you up the sideline where everyone else has to run fast after the really fast guy, like over pursue that and let make him cut inside. Uh, I thought Georgia tech did some great stuff with formations and shifts and motions doing really creative stuff, putting four receivers into the boundary, covering up receivers consistently to try and confuse Florida state motioning from the backside off of that to again, try and confuse Florida state. Because if you've got, if you're in a, in a three by one formation, three receivers to the field, one receiver to the boundary, but the, the the two receivers that are closest to the sideline to the field are both on the line of scrimmage. That second guy is ineligible. Then you motion a guy across, and this is not stuff that defenders see all the time. So now you're in the first game, you're having to think quickly. Okay, do I cover this guy? Do I cover that guy? What's my responsibility? He's ineligible. What do I do? Next thing you know, the ball snapped. That kind of stuff had Florida State very, very just discombobulated over the course of the game. I am not ready to say that they that that Boston College will cover because Boston College, I don't think Bill O'Brien, new coach, new staff, all that. I don't think Boston College is going to present the same type of pre-snap issues that Georgia Tech does. Georgia Tech presents a ton of pre-snap conflict and then it continues through the play. I don't think Boston College will do that. It will allow Florida State to line up and play fast, hopefully, if you're a Florida State fan. Um, and also, I don't think Boston College's skill is as good as Georgia Tech's uh, or their defense. Like, I don't think their defensive front is as good as Georgia Tech's. Their linebackers aren't as good as Georgia Tech's. Their secondaries, maybe, but but I don't think they're as good as Georgia Tech. Like, Georgia Tech is a top third of the league team right now as currently presented with the quarterback, the offensive line, the running back, the receivers, and all the rest. Like, they are they are a very good team. So I'm not ready to jump on that quite yet trip but well thank you for slowing think. me down because i reserve the right to change my mind until saturday morning yeah <laughs> yes well or in this case monday night because that's the only oh, yeah. that's, that's the right. only game on the board when uh, when florida state hosts bill o'brien and the new look bc eagles is castellano still at bc by the way he is yeah yeah, yeah he is he's a quarterback that's, i can scoot just saying he can scoot <laughs> just Look, saying if, if you if you want to be worried he, he they will uh he will present more issues than yes. Haynes King in the scramble game. Haynes didn't scramble a ton. Uh he sort of moved in the pocket and made some great throws. He is not as good a thrower as Haynes, um, but he is a much bigger issue scrambling. And if you look at Florida State's discipline in the last game, that was a bit of an issue. Um so yeah, I would I, I would be concerned about that. But he's gonna have to have a monster game for them to beat them. Why are you? Why were you rolling your eyes at uh, Bill O'Brien? 
I you don't, just, you don't I mean, like Bill I, the yeah, fact that he's, the B, he's, he's, back the in, he's back in college football. He's at Boston uh, College. You know, he's 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 B.O.B. hate, man. This was a guy who at one point was, uh, I mean, obviously he was the head coach at Penn State. He's been at, he's been at the Nick Saban School of Rehabilitation. So we'll see. We'll Stop forgetting, he was a very up. successful NFL head coach. He was successful until he the became NFL the GM level. as well. And, and then, now he's at a place there. in BC where, I mean, look. I'm not saying they don't care about college sports. They care, but it's just, I mean, they don't care that much. It's a pro sports town. We'll see how it goes. I'm just curious. I'm curious to see how it goes. Because I did I'm feel t- like, Roddy, and I think you kind of touched on this, I think Brent Key had a game plan. He executed it very well. I'm not going to say he outcoached Mike Norvell, but in many areas, Georgia Tech was prepared. They played high IQ football. They went out and executed. They did all the things Look, that dude, a Georgia Tech football team that's a double-digit underdog them. has to do. I don't think Mark Norvell coached poorly in that game, but I think he got out coached. Yeah, like when you, okay. yeah, when you have the more talented team and you lose. The, the other the other thing, Trip. I, I'm not so sure they are the more talented team, but but the I mean, other thing, Trip, is early on. Like, watch the first two drives in their tempo. It was a it, it was one of two things. Uh, it was very slow. Like they were taking the play clock down within ten seconds. So they talking contrib- Florida State or Georgia Florida State? State. Florida State. They contributed to this low possession game because they were super, super methodical to start the game, which was curious to me. It was like, why are they going so slow? Yeah, that's all the scripted stuff. That's the stuff. Those are the first 30 plays that you already know you're going to run. Yeah. But some of it might be the helmet communication. Some of it might be, hey, let's get DJ settled. But like, if I have the, if I am confident I have the better team, I want as many plays as possible in that freaking game. Because if my good guys play against your guys that are not as good, consistently we should have more success they were super methodical and i thought that was either hubris by florida state like oh we'll get the ball back like it's all good Uh, we'll be able to stop them on defense so it doesn't matter if we go slow or it was a a discomfort with how the offense was was going to operate with dj uyongalole um and i and the play calls kind of make me lean towards the latter I want to talk about some of these week one games. I want to talk about some of this Thursday stuff because, Roddy, you're going to be in Boulder. Real quick, though, did either one of you guys, keep it in the ACC, either one of you guys lock in on SMU Nevada on Saturday night because a little worried about Rhett Lashley and company, 28-point favorites needing some late-game heroics to win at the at the lowly Wolfpack in Reno. Like, that's... I know it's week zero, man. I don't want to overreact, but I, that that was another thing that surprised me from the weekend. Don't know if a lot of people are talking about it, Roddy. Did you, did you break down some film? What did we see? Yeah, so I watched. Uh, I watched most of the game. I uh, got to the like the end of the third quarter before I went to sleep. Uh, I have watched the defensive, the uh, SMU defensive film. Um, I have not watched the SMU offense because it wasn't loaded yet. But uh, but I have seen how the game ended. This this to me is like typical week zero type stuff. Like this was a, an SMU team that was just disjointed, had a ton of like really dumb, sloppy stuff happen early in the game, and then eventually realized that like, hey, we're down at Nevada, like we need to turn it on, and did. So so I'm not ready to jump off of whatever SMU train I was on, which wasn't ACC championship train. Um, but I am, you know, I I think I think this one is much easier to excuse away as week zero than florida state because we saw smu sort of flip the switch and the defense actually played pretty well we saw smu flip the switch uh and we did not see that with florida state um the thing is like that quarterback was really good for nevada especially running the ball he's what created issues for them defensively everything else they had pretty much controlled they made a couple plays downfield if i remember correctly but like i'm not worried about smu after that okay i'm just checking i mean they blew up my parlay you know, so I, I just I yeah, wanted to yeah. at least get some update on, on what happened. I see you smiling over Nevada, there. Nevada, man. I told <clears throat> Nevada and the points, they're they're only dangerous when they host a big name opponent. That's the only time they ever <laughs> Which cover does, when is, I mean, how often does that happen? Well, I don't mean like big name. I mean the games they covered last season were like where they had against, no business was uh, I think at home against Kansas. I don't know. Maybe I'm remembering it wrong, but a couple of big names they tend to play a little better. I, I know it's early in the week. Uh the lock doctor, excuse me, the doc of locks, uh will will chime in here a little bit later. Roger Thomas did go one and two, uh picking against a glorious, a glorious one and two. He picked glorious State. one and two. So I mean he bought he bought the win. Uh New Mexico never in doubt there. Uh you had Smoo. 
minus 27 and a half. And it, Which it never I, I did close. not, when I said it last week, I did not feel good about it. I don't, I listen, it's too wondering. early for that, man. Don't be making excuses. That's your, yeah. that's your time to shine. Make your picks and live with them. Let's talk about some of these Thursday night lights, Roddy. You're hitting the road. You're going to Boulder. It's awesome that you get to uh, that you get to call this game. You're going to hit a lot of eyeballs, man. It's probably the game of the night. North Dakota State at Colorado. First and foremost, have you been to Boulder before? Have no. you ever taken in a game at Folsom Field? No, you haven't. No, no, it'll be a first for me. So, I mean, I feel comfortable saying this, man. Like Boulder is a top ten college town in this country. Really? Yeah. Dude, it, especially this time of the year, it's going to. I haven't looked at the weather. Trip is our resident meteorologist on this show. On it, dude. Boulder is stunning. Yeah. Like it is. You've been to Colorado. Like you're you're not unfamiliar with like elevations, mountain culture. I mean, I come on. I am very unfamiliar with it. Like I live in Atlanta, Georgia. So yeah, when Stone we go mountain, out there, right down the street. <laughs> Bro, the so so my my brother went to Air Force Academy for a couple of years. We won't okay, okay. Um, so I was like been out to Colorado Springs, and the thing that surprised me the most is the depth perception when you get to places like this. Because first off, everything's far from each other out west. Like you get west of the Mississippi, and everything's far away from each other. Secondly, it's like the mountains are so freaking big that they look close, and then you walk like. 20 minutes you're like i am no closer to these damn mountains than i was 20 minutes ago what is going on with this like everything is so far away and then the elevation hits you in the face so um you know we're gonna have to we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to act, uh, we're gonna have to get acclimated to the yes. to the elevation we're gonna take yes. a little nebulizer make sure the vocal cords are good <laughs> are you really <laughs> i might i know i have one Dude, I, I got one last year because my voice, you know, you get I remember, stressed. I remember you were going through that. Yeah, my kids my have a nebulizer because one yeah. of them has asthma. And, like, sometimes I'll hit that thing. Like, if my throat's bothering me, it works. It works really, really well. Get the little nebby. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Really good. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a real It's in the studio. I mean, Roddy's got it ready to go. Oh, dude. dude, ready to go. I actually probably will take it up because you never know. Like, a little sickness hit you. I mean, TSA is probably going to check that thing if you put it in your carry-on, but I, I would. Why not? Only carry-on. Bro, you never check a bag. What are we doing? Man, come on. You you, you carry everything? Seriously? Oh, yeah. check yeah, bags? Yeah. You're bringing no. suits. Yeah, check. You don't check. A, no, we're not checking that. Do you I have a garment it. bag or you just fold it? Well, how, so I have, a, I have a rolling garment bag, which generally keeps the suit very pretty nice. But it does get then, folded. Right, it does get bag, folded yes. in half. Yeah, yep. I know what you're talking yep. about here. And then yeah. the, the you know the shirts you're gonna have to iron anyway. Uh, the suit usually once you get there is pretty good. You hang it. It's got a couple days to you know do its thing. So it'd be all right by the time game time hits. This is I don't need to tell you this because you you've been prepping for this game. But like North Dakota State at Colorado, eight o'clock on ESPN. Roddy Jones on the call. Love to see it. Uh, I mean, a lot of people think the Bison are going to pull this upset, man. So I, I would love to get your take on how realistic you think that is or is not. I th it entirely depends to me on Colorado. Look, North Dakota State is going to come out, and I think uh, they've got a new coach, Tim Polsek, who was, uh, was previously there under Craig Bull and Chris Kleiman, uh, has won multiple national championships there, uh, has spent uh, the last three years as the offensive coordinator at Wyoming, after spending the prior three years as the offensive line coach at Iowa. So, like, that's the type of coach you're getting. A guy who bleeds green and yellow from North Dakota State, a guy who spent time at the right knee of the father of offensive line play, Kirk Ferentz, uh, in Iowa, and then goes to Wyoming under Craig Bowl and sort of expands the offense a little bit. Like, I thought Wyoming, especially with their talent, did a really good job um, accentuating the quarterback's ability to run T formationally taking some shots um, or formationally being varied enough where they were a mostly 11 personnel like most places. But if you're, you know, been in Iowa and been in North Dakota State, like you get big personnel groups, 13, one back, three tight ends, a lot of 22, two backs, two tight ends. But they would do that stuff, yes, to run the football, but also to take shots because they don't, they didn't have five guys that could take the top off the defense. They had like one or two. So you bring in all the big people, make them get really big, and then you give that one guy who can take the top off the defense a lot of room downfield to go make plays. So so I think I know what we're going to get from North Dakota State. I think they're going to be more aggressive defensively. That's just a, a hunch after listening to defensive coordinator talk some. 
Uh, but it will entirely depend on Colorado. Can they block a North Dakota State front that doesn't have elite pass rushers? Can they block them? That's no, question number one. Retooled offensive line, all that. Number two is can they stop North Dakota State? And and North Dakota State is, uh, again, an offense that is going to be physical. They are going to bludgeon you. Um, can Colorado match that? We'll see. They are improved on the defensive line. Uh, to the point where they think they are, they have a chance to be really good there, and I don't disagree entirely. Like they've got some players who have produced at Power Five programs, um, so I think that that pass rush could be really good. Uh, their depth at receiver should be really good. Um, their quarterback is really good, but you know, does that lead you to winning? I we'll see. You know, we'll see. Well, the line of scrimmage is, has been the thing going back to last year with Colorado even yeah. when they burst onto the scene it wasn't because of you know they had that hot start and it wasn't because of outstanding line play and the depth and the fact that this team got dinged up and Shadur was was hurt the second half of the year when they they just nosedived you're right about receiver you're right about quarterback obviously uh, they also brought in Dallin Hayden from Ohio State who a curiously lot, is not like that's your boy yeah <laughs> is my boy no, Steve it's my boy. It's, it's, one of, it's one of my boys. Yeah, Jalen Hayden's one of your boys. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Is there yeah. a story behind this? Can I hear? Yeah. The story? What ha- What happened there? Because I'm trying to piece it together. And I Ohio can't quite State remember. was banged up last year at running back. Right? Didn't Travion Henderson miss like four or five games at one point? That's his entire career. Yeah. And yeah, I thought Dallin always... Hayden was going to come in and you know right the ship. He did yeah. not. No, he mm. he did not. And 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 thus he hit. He hit the road. But L- listening to all the Colorado stuff, though, like he's not even the starter right now. Well, that's a good thing if you're Colorado. I mean, <laughs> is it? You've got, they've, you've got they've a lot got, of weapons. Dude, you've got they've a got lot a guy of named. They've got a former walk-on named Charlie Offerdahl or Offendahl as listed as the starter above a, a guy who transferred in from from Ohio State. I do not think that is great for Colorado, unless it's just like a hey, Charlie's the reliable guy, but Dallin and these other guys are going to get most of the carries. Like if Charlie Offerdahl, no offense to him. But I, I think in order for – if he's getting most of the carries, this offense is not as good as it can be because the physically talented guys are the ones that are behind. Everybody knows about Travis Hunter and Jimmy Horn. I I, I loved Will Shepard when he was at Vanderbilt. I, he played at Vanderbilt, so people yep. made – you know, it's like, well, you know, it's Vanderbilt. Uh, this dude's really good. I mean, they've got they've got a lot of weapons around well, Shadur, but they've got to keep him upright, Roddy. They have to. And, and LeJonte Le- Wester transfers in from FAU um, – he had I, I want to get this right so I don't so I don't uh so I don't misquote it or exaggerate. Uh Lejante Wester had um like a hundred and eight catches. Oh no, it's in my notebook. He had a hundred and eight catches or something like that for like thirteen hundred yards at FAU. Hundred and eight oh. receptions, eleven hundred and sixty eight yards and eight touchdowns for FAU last year. And and Will Shepard had eight touchdowns in the SEC at Vandy last year. Like they have they have players like real players at the receiving uh, at the receiver positions. When do you get your FaceTime with Coach Prime? What's that look tomorrow. Like? Uh, tomorrow. It, uh, Wednesday, Wednesday. Yeah. So he'll give you the time of day because you're national TV, but you know local media, not as not as much, right? Uh, one particular local media has just been, one, uh, just has one, been, has been uh, you know told not to that they can't ask questions anymore. But yeah, I expect. I look, I've I've never done a game out there. I have interviewed Coach Prime before, before he was Coach Prime on the sidelines of the Independence Bowl, Florida State, and uh, who they play that game? Can't remember who they played. Southern Miss, maybe. Yeah, Brett Favre was there. Mm-hmm. Florida State, Southern Miss in the Independence Bowl in 2017. I've got a picture of that. Me and Coach Prime may show that to him soon as we uh you should you should be like hey what's up big dog look i'm i'm i am excited to watch this game i'm not a colorado fan i'm not a colorado hater like i understand that they are a lightning rod for discussion they're buried in the preseason predictions in the big 12 we've talked about the big 12 man it's a fascinating league there's like eight teams that you know might be able to win this thing when it's all said and done colorado is not considered to be one of them the schedule is brutal they're at Nebraska week two. They're at Colorado State week three. November is just, I mean, it's landmines everywhere. Like, it, yeah. it's its not the Florida Gators schedule to close out the season, but it's pretty damn tough. It's so the they, Big 12 version of it. They got to have this. Like, that's the thing. They, they have to have this. It's a team that's obviously got a ton of new faces. They hit the portal really hard. 
do they have an identity outside of what Shadur can do at, at quarterback? We're going to find out. But to your to, to your earlier point about the Bison, North Dakota State does have an identity. Like they know what they want to do. So it's 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 a clash. And, and of they two are very, very styles. They are very confident that they're going to do it. Yeah, like that's yeah. We are like, going, they speak in affirmatives more than any coaching staff I've I've ever heard. We are going to do this. We are going to do that. Like we are going to be physical. We are going to tackle the hell out of people. We are going to hit you in the mouth. Like to the point where I'm like, oh, you got me believing. Let's go. You also get to be a part of one of the cooler college football traditions in pregame when Ralphie runs out onto Ralph. the field. Did you know Ralphie's a bison? I I did know that. Ralphie is a she. It's a it's a girl. Ralphie, Ralphie is a girl. Ralphie's and, a female. And she is not a buffalo. She is a bison. Right. And and she runs. Well, I guess I guess she is a bison because she's not a North Dakota State bison. I don't know how that works. When I the lived in when bison. I lived in Athens a lifetime ago and did uh, radio there Colorado came and played for whatever reason Damon Evans the then athletic director uh, of Georgia was booking like home and homes with Arizona State and Colorado when Colorado came to Sanford Stadium they brought Ralphie oh really and you want to talk about like you know Sanford Stadium is a big place it holds like 92,000 people Roddy has you know may or may not have you know ripped some hedges out of that place and and, and chewed on them at some point in time but People were in their seats in pregame to like see Ralphie, see Ralphie. run, which was kind of yeah. cool. Um, cool. And, and you can actually feel the ground like kind of tremble a little that's bit. That's cool. Yeah, that's it was cool. cool. So that that's going to be awesome. I'm happy for you. It's going to be an exciting game. That's eight o'clock on ESPN. Roddy Jones alongside Mark Jones, I believe, on the call. Yep. Love that's to see great. it. The other game of note. ACC implications here. UNC at Minnesota. Trip. this line has been what swinging that? back and forth, back and forth. UNC, as we record the show on Tuesday morning, now a one-and-a-half point favorite. Yeah. Last week, the Gophers were like a two-point favorite. Again, man, like I'm, I'm comfortable coming on the show and being like, I don't know what I'm going to see. I'm excited to watch it. I think there's a lot of pressure on North Carolina this year. Even though they don't have an NFL, you know, first round pick at quarterback for the first time in like a decade, but man, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. I don't know what you expect to see from that game, Roddy, but I'd be fascinated to get your thoughts. Yeah, the well, it's, it's, the question is, what are these quarterbacks going to do? Both schools have new quarterbacks. Minnesota's quarterback Mac, Max Brosmer, new the New Hampshire transfer. Why can't I say New Hampshire? The New Hampshire transfer. Threw for a bajillion yards last year in FCS. You know, can he do it at Minnesota? Probably not. They're pro that's not the way they want to play. Uh, but then offensively for North Carolina, uh, has Max Johnson been named the starter? I haven't seen them name a starter yet. I don't think so. Yeah. I haven't seen either. So, so I mean, I'll, I'll Google it quickly while we're talking. But but well, I'm overall, just doing that now. Um, North Carolina is really good everywhere other than – the offensive line and the quarterback and those two are unknowns for him on offense they have a really good running back they got a really good group of receivers like they are they are set up for success if the offensive line can be decent and the quarterback can be consistent like that's kind of what you're looking for out of north carolina I, I like north carolina in the game because i think their defense will be improved i'm not convinced that minnesota will have the weapons to be able to score points with north carolina if the offensive line is 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 good, if the defense is improved, um, so you know overall, I, I kind of like I kind of like this North Carolina team, but I'm putting a lot of faith in the fact that the quarterback's going to be fine and the offensive line is going to be okay. I mean, you may or may not have said over the summer that you think North Carolina starts eight and zero this year. I, I may or may not have heard that from you. I uh, you walking let me, that back. Let me, see if I, let me see if I stand by that. Are, are you, are uh, schedule uh, Minnesota, Blindstone? Charlotte. Central, James Madison, Duke, Pitt. Uh, they played Georgia Tech in those first eight games. Get out of here with your James Madison stuff. They had a for the Dukes. Get out of here. Uh, Virginia. Look, yeah, I think they could be seven and one going into Florida State. They have trouble with Georgia Tech, and Georgia Tech's good now. So, like, I can't, I can't say they're gonna win that game. Can't say they're gonna win it. They don't beat Georgia Tech. It just don't happen. <laughs> Sorry, Mac Brown. Check the records. 
Trip, do you have a lean? Like, I, I know it's only Tuesday, but, I mean, this, this game's coming up on Thursday before we get to the weekend. And, by the way, John Height is going to be stopping by here in about five minutes. We're going to talk uh, – we're going to do a deep dive on, on Clemson and Georgia coming up on Saturday in Atlanta. But do you have a strong yeah, take on the other? I mean, initially – yeah, initially Minnesota, but – Row the boat. Um, I, I, just, I think too many people – like, everybody I talk to, everybody seems to agree – and like Minnesota, but it's like what you guys were just talking about. UNC, what an opportunity if they can win this game. Like, obviously, JMU's not a layup. Um, Georgia well, Tech's not on, a layup. Hold on, but, hold on. We said that based on chance. JMU last year. How many people does JMU have coming back, Stephen? Listen, we can save the JMU talk. I'm excited to see what they do down at Club Lit this weekend, okay? Yeah. They got to go to Charlotte. Not going to be easy. Get out of here. Charlotte was terrible last year. That was Not last year. Easy. Get out. What? Oh, my goodness. A lot of new faces at JMU. Biff Pokey, uh, maybe he's building something down there in the Queen City. I don't know. We'll see. So it's not a layup trip. You're right. Put some respect on our name. I appreciate yeah, I th- that. I think UNC's got a great chance here, but they need things to start off right. Don't love the fact that, you know, when you Google it, you can't find out who their starting quarterback is, though. Well, I'll t- uh, look, it's either Max Johnson, Connor Harrell, or Jacoby Criswell. Yeah, it's one of the guys on the team. You got three and quarterbacks. You got none, Roddy. Come I on, mean, we, know, we know that. It's, but it's – it's it's uh, I, I think between those three, it, like it, I think it's Max Johnson's job. I, I, I do. I think you don't name a starter because out of respect to Connor Harrell, Jacoby Criswell sort of come along. I have talked to people that think they brought in Jacoby Criswell because they were not convinced about Max Johnson and Connor Harrell. I've also talked to people that, you know, have kind of hinted that Jacoby Criswell wanted to come back. And, and so they gladly accepted him and sort of gave him every opportunity because apparently he was in a quarterback competition with Drake May back in the day. I don't believe that, but but sure. Um, I don't know, man. Like, I uh, I am concer- concerned a little bit, but but not so much where it's not going to have me go. Uh, other game. games of note, maybe teams of note that we're going to see on Thursday, uh, NC State. Preseason 24 in the AP poll, uh, they'll destroy Western Carolina, but w- we get our first look at the Wolfpack this uh, this season. That's a 7 o'clock kick on, on ACC Network. Preseason ranked Kansas. Yes, you heard that right. Do not adjust your radio dials. Preseason number 22 in the AP poll. Jalen Daniels is back. Devin Neal is back. They could be dangerous. Uh, they are playing their games this year, by the way, not in Lawrence because yep. that stadium is under construction. So in Kansas City. As a radio dork, I'm just fascinated to like listen to that broadcast. It's not look, you can't just show up at a place and like plug in radio gear and like get on the air. It's not that easy. But so, they're playing at two places that are accustomed to it. Like they're not playing at high school stadiums. They're playing at the place where sporting Kansas City plays and then the place that the Chiefs play. Okay. They're playing at Arrowhead? They're playing games yeah. at Arrowhead this year? Yeah, I didn't know the that. the I first didn't know two that. games are at are at the sporting Kansas City stadium and then the rest of them are at arrowhead okay that's a I, I, this is this is key information for when we go on with the blitz thursday so thank you for educating me kansas is taking on some school named lindenwood that should be no problem ranked missouri taking hey, on hey, murray you put some state respect on lindenwood's name I, I think they made a regional not too long ago i will not put respect on Li- easy trip i will not put respect on lindenwood's name uh missouri taking on <laughs> murray state uh, they're ranked very high in the preseason polls. We need to have a discussion about Missouri at some point. Maybe not today, but like they're not going anywhere this year. They're going to be hanging around, hanging around. We gotta, we gotta keep an eye on Missouri. I'm just saying. Do we? Okay, we'll keep an eye on them. Look at the schedule by SEC yeah, standards. Schedule. Missouri has a yeah. dream conference slate, which yeah. is not so easy go, to do. So they go to Winston Salem. Oh no, that's Ole Miss that goes to Winston Salem. Who does yeah. who did they play in the no, Boston College goes to Missouri, right? That sounds right. Yes, yeah. Ole Miss is coming to uh to Deep Town uh, yeah, this September, Roddy. Maybe watch out. I think that's watch a CW out. game. So you're not you're gonna it is be, a CW game. You're not gonna be making it up here for that one, but I don't I know a lot of people who will be. Let's bring it's in our guest. In there. Let, let's talk a little Clemson in Georgia, okay? We got John Height with us, does a great job with Clemson's uh, flagship radio station down there, one oh five five the roar. Uh, John, thank you for joining us and, and, and talking a little ball with us. Paint the picture for us, man. Like Clemson, Georgia, I, I know a lot of Georgia folks. I married a Georgia folk. They they feel like they're going to just like stroll into the bends on Saturday and and just kind of cruise in this game. I, I, I would be curious to know, like from the Clemson 
standpoint, you do a daily talk show down there. You you have your pulse on the fans. Like, how are people feeling about this game at noon on Saturday, man? Nervous, definitely nervous. Uh, a lot of anxiety, but definitely um, excited about the opportunity. I think Georgia should be confident coming into this game. They have the returning guys. You have Carson Beck. You have a lot of continuity in that staff with Mike Bobo and Glenn Schumann and Kirby Smart and everybody there. So I understand the confidence of the Georgia fan, but I think where Clemson likes coming in as this quiet underdog is really it starts with the defensive line. You got guys like Demonte Capehart, Peter Woods, TJ Parker, Peyton Page. That's as good of a front four as you can find out there in college football. I really like about five or six linebackers on this defense. I think the starting three, Barrett Carter, Wade Wood as. I like Kobe McLeod, D. Creighton, the five-star freshman, Sammy Brown, I think is going to be a good participant. I think the secondary is going to be better, even though with the loss of Andrew McCuba, year two, Khalil Barnes, year two, A.B. on Terrell. I think you're going to see a lot of growth out of that unit. So I think that's where some confidence starts with Clemson fans is when you look at this defense against the amount of production that Georgia's having to replace especially at the playmakers, no Brock Bowers, no Lad McConkey, no Ra Ra Thomas. The top two running backs are gone. A couple stars on that offensive line. Now, George is very talented. When I look at that Clemson defense, I look at a unit that I think that can be able to hang with the Bulldogs uh, for four quarters on Saturday. We're, we're not yeah. getting 10 to three, though, like we did a couple years ago in Charlotte. No, 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 but if you remember that game, the, uh, the over-under was set around a little over 50. Yeah. And it's not going to be in that range either. I'm thinking... If I had to pick a score, I think it's about a seven-point game right now. I think like 27-20, uh, I Ooh. think it's going to be something like that. I think it's going to be a defensive-led football game. I think both offenses will be able to find some success, but I think both of these defenses have the advantage going into this game. Yeah, I don't disagree. I think it's going to be low scoring. I think it's you know 17-14 at the yeah. end of the game, something like that. Uh, all right, you, you talk about continuity. It's something that Clemson has with its quarterback and offensive coordinator. I am a big fan of development. I'm a, a big proponent of like, hey, Cade Klubnick can get better from what he did last year, especially as a first-year starter. There were some jitters. There were some very key mistakes made in crucial situations. But generally, guys learn from that, and they don't do that again. How confident are you that Cade Klubnick takes a step forward? And if you are confident, like how big a step do you think he can take? I don't. I think it'll be a pretty big step. No, I think he's going to be a finalist in New York this fall. No, I do not. I don't think well, he's going to reach those yeah. types of heights. I don't know if my EA Sports College Football twenty five is is like a hard <laughs> of what to come. But Georgia Tech beat Florida State week one. Now, I was controlling Georgia Tech, so of course we did Certainly. in my EA Sports dynasty. But Kate Klubnick won the Heisman. I mean, wow! It, it is to be said. It is. It is done. If that happens, it would be the first Heisman Trophy winner in Clemson history. I think it would be pretty incredible for it to be Cade Plumnick, especially to have a Heisman Trophy winner under Dabo Swinney, because if you think about all the talent he's had, if Coach Swinney wanted a Heisman by now, he probably would have gotten one, just loaded up some guy's stats. But I believe in Cade Plumnick. I believe in year two growth. I mean, we talk about it on our show all the time, but we start talking teams across the country that we feel good about year two of these quarterbacks of these OCs. But when we go to Clemson, we're like, ah, I don't know. I don't know if he can do it. Well, why not, Cade? The offensive line, you've got eight guys that are going to be coming back this year who have started games for you. Matt Luke, one of the best offensive line coaches in the business. I feel better about shoring that thing up. Now, is it going to take two to three years to get to elite through recruiting? Yes. But I do believe an in initial coaching can get these guys better. And I think also if you go back to last spring and Cade Klubnick's first year in this offense, they went into spring practice with four scholarship wide receivers. I'm sorry, four receivers total, like one on scholarship. It was Nobody was there. Antonio Williams, Tyler Brown wasn't even on campus yet. So there wasn't a whole lot of time to, for them to find continuity in this offense. And if you look at that Notre Dame game and the, the five-game win streak to end the season, when they kind of simplified the playbook, got into more of a zone-blocking front, and just kind of did some easier check-down passes, things really took off for this offense. And so I think if you look at the the end stretch for this, uh, for Cade Klovnick and you talk about uh, Cade getting better, Garrett Riley getting better. Why can't the wide receivers get better? Why can't the inclusion of these two freshmen? I think Bryant Wesco, you're going to see a lot of him on Saturday against the Bulldogs. I think TJ Moore will be incorporated as the season goes on. You get those two guys, a junior Antonio Williams, a sophomore Tyler Brown. I think there's a lot to like about the growth of this passing attack. Do I think it'll be the best in the ACC? No, but do I think it could be top five? Absolutely. How much pressure is on Garrett Riley this year, John, from, from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's just it feels like this time last year there was so much anticipation about what that's going to look like with him coming over from TCU and obviously what he was able to do 
uh, in Fort Worth. But, you know, he, he kind of fell flat last year. I, I'm, I'm curious yeah. to get your take on that. I, I think he will um, He will grow. You know, when you know, I was talking about they didn't have any receivers, he barely knew any of his personnel. I sat down with Garrett Riley last year about two weeks before fall camp started and was asking about his personnel, and a lot of just, I don't know, we'll see what happens. And so I think a lot of it was them trying to figure things out on the fly. A lot of the GT counter run concepts that they were trying to use last year just did not work. They were getting blown up. The linemen could not pull to get in front of guys, and so the run game just it was not effective. Therefore, the passing game wasn't. I think what Garrett Riley really did was shore up some of the blocking, something simplified a lot of things as they went in November, and things really took off. I think now that he's got a good grasp of his personnel, working with Coach Sweeney and the rest of the coaches on this staff, because he didn't bring anybody over with him from TCU. He had to coach the entire Clemson offensive coaching staff on how to run his system. So I think everybody in year two, I, I think you see a big jump with Garrett Riley. I am fascinated to see what the offense looks like because you mentioned it. Like he didn't bring anybody over, and a lot of the the like foundational principles about that offense didn't work. I mean, every sort of the the Lincoln Riley tree and everybody who kind of runs that stuff, they are huge counter people. Like they run yes. a ton of counter, and a lot of stuff works off of that. Well, if you can't run counter, like it blows up <laughs> a lot of stuff. And so then you 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 go more zone, but it takes away a lot of the movement stuff that you do. It just didn't. So I, I am curious, like with Matt Luke coming in, and and uh, I've done some Matt Luke games before, and, and I've seen kind of him him over the years. Like I don't remember him being a big counter guy, but but we'll see. Like we'll see kind of how that develops. Um, you mentioned the defense, and I, I want to dig into that a little bit. Like everybody knows about Barrett Carter, but these guys up front, um, you you mentioned some of them, like Demonte Cape, Part, Peyton Page, guys that played. But T.J. Parker was a freshman last year. Peter Woods, freshman last year. Peter Woods was okay last year, right. wasn't kind of what we expected. What kind of step can he take? T.J. Parker was very good last year, especially in moments. What do you expect of him this season? I expect uh, Peter Woods to be more than a guy that just absorbs a bunch of double teams. And I think that's what he did a lot of last year. He was tasked to go just clog up the A-gap, make things messy, and kind of let linebackers and you know T.J. Parker and some of those ends go make plays. But this year, what I feel like when you have the strength of K. Part, Page, um, uh, Vic Burley, a Trey Williams on the inside. They're going to play Peter Woods at end a lot of the season. A 320-pound defense. Is that, is that gimmicky? Like, Do no. you feel like that's gimmicky? I do because not. Because he's no. not going to get after the passer there. I think he may be able to. It's not going to be more of your simple like rip swim techniques on the outside rush the passer. I think he can kind of bull rush his way back there and collapse the pocket. But I think it will also be situationally dependent. Now, if you look at against Georgia Te or against Georgia in week one, they have probably the biggest offensive line in the country. You got to go big on big. I can't put a 250 pound end out there. He's just going to get blown off the line of scrimmage. So I think what Peter Woods is going to be able to do is kind of collapse things and allow to just, you know, the linebackers to kind of make plays. I don't uh, really see him as like a true sack artist, yeah. but more of just a disruptor on the outside to allow other guys to go make plays. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. John, what if this, what if this game Saturday isn't competitive? Like, what I'm not saying think like Clemson blows them out. No, yeah, thank you, Ronnie. No, what if this? I'm not saying like Oregon, like forty nine to three a couple years ago. But right. like, what if this? What if this thing is like a twenty, thirty point margin? Like, I'm just curious. Like, from your perspective, right? Because I I've done local talk radio, and sometimes it's I'm not saying it's fun to hit the panic button, but like <laughs> if if things don't if things aren't competitive at the bends, then what? Well, I think then you you have to kind of regroup, right? And I think that's one of the beauties of the 12-team playoff is that a game like this in week one a couple of years ago, your chances at having any sort of postseason opportunity were pretty much out of the window outside of running the table. If Clemson still wants to get to the playoff, you go win the league. That's all you really need to do. Now, is it tough because Georgia's 90 minutes down the road and this is a fan base that you – mingle with every single day. Yeah, that would be tough for Clemson fans to get up off the mat. No doubt about it. Tough to go to church on Sunday morning. It'd be very difficult, but I don't think it destroys your season like it would have in years past. Now, if you come back and you look like Luster against App State and you come back after the bye and NC State beat you at home, then I think you're having a real different set of, you know, different conversation. But I think I, we have tried to, over the summer to kind of talk to our listeners about, hey, this is not the end-all, be-all of the season. I mean, yes, Georgia is an arch rival. Yes, it's somebody that you very much want to beat. But you also have to know that this is the number one team in the country, deservedly so, and that that possibility is out there. But you could still 11-1, 10-2, make the postseason and still find a really successful season. 
I love that this game is being played because Clemson and Georgia should play regularly, in my opinion. Absolutely. Like, I mean, look, I'm, I'm a guy from Atlanta. I love the regional rivalries. I almost went to Clemson. I wish I could have gone to Georgia when I was little. Like, I, that, that is what I wished. So, so absolutely, like, this game should be played. Since, since I am not one of those people that just feeds at the trough of the SEC like my co-host Stephen Hartzell, oh, asking what God, if Clemson right. gets blown out in this game and it's not – like, what if Clemson wins, damn it? What Thank if you. Clemson wins? It's a fair question to ask. Well, then I'm going to have a great day on my show Tuesday morning from 9 to noon at uh, 105.5 The Roar. I can tell you that much. Um, I think it would be a lot of uh, vindication for Dabo Sweeney and kind of the way in which he runs the program. Do we all necessarily agree with the transfer portal, transfer portal philosophy 100% of the time? No. But I understand why he does what he does. And I think the way that it's very easy to kind of throw dirt on this program the last few years when, you know, you had the disaster year of only winning nine games last year and you still were able to win 10 with a terrible offense under DJ. I think if you were able to win this game on Saturday, I think it just sends a message that that Clemson's here. And then when you're looking at the ACC, they should be taken seriously and maybe potentially taken seriously for the postseason. Following up on that, like how have Clemson fans – expectations change with Florida State's loss in Dublin? They feel like a, a window is a little bit more open. But I think right now, especially since we're just a couple days removed, Clemson fans are more enjoying the fact that DJ didn't have a great game. Oh. I think that's where the Clemson mindset was yesterday on our show. A lot of the conversation was about DJ. And I, see, it wasn't, I really like, whoo! <laughs> you know, it wasn't just not. us. Like, you know, it turns out, you know, we weren't the problem. Were we part of the problem? Yes, but we weren't the only problem. So I think there was a sense of vindication there for a lot of Clemson fans. Well, look, I just wanted to drop this one little nugget in here. Clemson hasn't been this big of an underdog since 2012 at Florida State in the crazy game where Jameis Winston dressed, but he was already suspended, if you remember that game. I so I don't know. I think I think it's a great spot for Clemson, honestly. If Dabo can't get them motivated as a 13-and-a-half-point dog, then when's it going to happen? Oh, that's a great question. If, if not in this game from a motivation standpoint, then you do have to ask that question. I think that's fair. But I also think that you can be incredibly motivated and Georgia still cover the spread. Yeah. Yeah, I think Dabo can have them with their hair on fire, ready to run through a brick wall, and Georgia just outmans them. You know, they're just better run through 85 on scholarship. Yeah, and, and Roddy and I talked about this a couple weeks ago during our preseason show. Like, you mentioned, John, like the weapons that are gone. Like, Brock Bowers caught a lot of third down passes yes. the, the last couple of years, right? And 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 we know that, like, Ra Ra's not on this team anymore, and... Yes, you've got a lot of very highly touted guys, but not a lot of experience around Carson Beck. So, look, we're, we're all going to learn something, not not just in, in Clemson and Georgia, but but in all these games on Saturday, and, and, and that's what kind of makes this fun. I, I do, I do want to know what time the game kicks at noon. Yes. You're, you're on the Clemson radio broadcast, so uh, you're not exactly rolling that ball out there 30 minutes before kick. What, what time does your day start on Saturday, John? So our day as a station, we have a uh, pregame show that will start from 6 a.m., go to 9 a.m. I'll get oh, here my. at about a little God, after boy. 8. Um, we go live for my pregame show, 9 a.m. We go right to kickoff, and then we have a postgame show for two hours uh, immediately upon the conclusion of the game. Are the phone lines open in postgame? That's what I no, want to No, they know. are not. They okay. are not. We <laughs> have never done begin. that. That is not – I don't want to bring up the whole Coach Sweeney college <laughs> show fiasco that we have never taken calls in postgame, and we probably never will if I have anything to say about it. Well, oh. jo Georgia's broadcast does. They don't lose games very often, but when they do, I, Ooh, I'm, I may – Must I'm, listen. It's a must I listen. may or may not dial up the Georgia post game show just to listen to just like you know really despondent Georgia fan yes. who's having to deal with their first loss in like two calendar years. Like it's oh, just if that is the case on my drive home Saturday night, I will be going back and forth between the college football blitz and the Georgia post game show because both will be incredibly entertaining. I might have to lean more plug. Georgia post game on this one. Yeah, you, know. you, you really love to hear it, John. The check's in the mail, buddy. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Hey, enjoy, enjoy Saturday. Thank you for hopping on with us, and uh, we will do it again real soon, man. Thank you. Keep up Absolutely. the good work, man. You guys do a great job at the Roar. Thank you, Roddy. I appreciate it. Thank you all for the opportunity. Have there a great you go. day. That's our man, John Height, down there in Clemson country. Battle of I-85, man. Like, it's, you know, it, it yes, the Benz is a home game for whoa, Atlanta, whoa, whoa, but whoa, 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 listen, whoa, 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 whoa. Clemson's Athens right up the road. is not on I-85. This is not on I-85. You got to no. get off 85 and then travel 316 and all that stuff. Not a battle for I-85. Get out of here.
I, I understand, but I mean, it's I, still I, listen, Georgia a, Tech Clemson is a battle of I 85. You Both know what's of funny? them on I 85. I, I have made highway references on the Blitz before, you know, like, hey, all you got to do is head east on I 40. And, and, and like, Trip will literally get in my ear and be like, bro, that's not even. That's not even the right highway, dude. Not on I-40. Like, just stop with the geography. Get to the game, man. Nobody cares what highway you have to get on to get you from know, Charlottesville but, to Raleigh. No one this cares. One, this one I don't. This one I don't. Uh, I don't forgive this one because you know how far away Athens is from I eighty five. It's twenty minutes, man. It's right there. You twenty get, minutes. You get, get off out of here. You get off at Commerce and hang a left, and you're there. It's not okay. It's not twenty minutes from Commerce, but okay. How far is it, Roddy? How far do you 30, think it is? At least no, 30, no, 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 no. You used to go to the Tech Rallies all way. the time. Man. I never, I never go that way. I never go that way. Of course you don't. Way. Course I go you don't. north, uh, 85, 316, and then you're just going. You're forever. a wanted man in Athens, man. I mean, look, I'm not. You, you Athens loves run, me, man. You don't just run for two bills between the hedges and think you can just roll through Bro, that place anytime you want. They don't care. They don't care. Not anymore. They don't care. Okay, but you know, prior to you know, prior to that first natty in four decades, they definitely cared. Okay, yeah, don't don't that. kid yourself. By the way, have the folks at the pickleball scene have they have they have they smartened up? Have they wised up to the fact that they're playing ball with like a former D one athlete? Are they on to you now? Yeah, they are. Uh, they are. They are. They all know that they're playing pickleball with the former D one athlete uh, because Jackie is you know very tall and long, and so everyone is aware that Jackie, my wife, uh, played volleyball at Wake Forest and uh, and that she is to be feared on the pickleball court. But not you. Eh, some people know. Some people don't care. They're okay. more, I'll be honest with you, like Jackie's really long at the net, uh, long-limbed individual she is. like, And so they're more like, oh my gosh, she covers so much at the net, we can't get anything past her, and I'm not good enough for anybody to care. So, so you guys are a mixed doubles team. Is that do I have sometimes, that right? You know, we play open play. We like to play together, uh, but sometimes we, you know, we mix it up. It's kind of, you know, depending on how it goes. I love that, man. I think that's adorable. I'll go We're to my to wife. Get We're I'll, to get I'll go to the Y with my wife. We'll do like a body pump class together sometimes, but that's about as yeah. far as I'm willing to take it, man. Really? About as, yeah. Hey, you, should like, play, you should play some sports with your wife. It's fun. I don't want to lose, man. Well, if you're Roddy, when you come to North Carolina and you want to find a high level pickleball game, give me a call. All right. You, you got, got it, man. You got a guy, hey, Trip. You got I'll a bring, guy. I'll, br- I'll bring my Arthel, paddle. You you already know this. I was big in the pickleball scene for like two years. Trip's got. Big I will say that Trip 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 is Trip's got great hands. He's you know he's, he's, <laughs> he's golf phenomenal golfer. I have not seen you on the pickleball court, but I would. If you be got surprised. good hands, then then you're you're probably not bad at pickleball. My worry with Trip is the footwear. You know you can't play bi- you can't play pickleball in hey dudes, and that's all okay. I've ever seen Trip wear. Come on, unless I'm we're not on the wearing golf hey course. dudes today. If you say so, well, you got your flip flops on today. No, you, I've you got take... Nikes on today. Okay. Free runs. You better Fit get like some New glove. Balances, man. Cooper Flag, bro. Attention. Hey, how was the uh, how was the show? How was the in person show? Uh, attention, Saturday? white people. Cooper Flag has signed with New Balance. The show was great. Yeah, what? Yeah, what was what's with that? Yeah, I guess New Balance playing to his base, man. The guy's from Maine. Like, what does terrible. he know? Um, the show was great. Thank Awful. you. Uh, we're hoping to put the live recording out on our feed. Uh, it was great to hang out with the Joes. It was great to be around people. I actually bumped into John, who just came on our show. He he listens awesome. to the Blitz. He's like, I'm so glad you guys are back with CSN. I love listening to you guys. So. I, it was very cool to meet people that I otherwise never would have met if not for yeah. our very silly gardening show about football. So it was cool. And, Roddy, I got a koozie for you, man, if you want one. Can't wait for it I to gotta, arrive in the mail. Well, you got to send me five bucks first, and then I will send it to you. And, and then I will send it to you in the mail. But, but Maybe got, I'll, I'll, I'll come grab it when you come down to Atlanta for the SEC championship game. Okay, very good. I think you'll be coming up to Winston-Salem before I go down to Atlanta, but we'll we'll worry oh, about that. Yeah, okay, you and Mark Jones ain't coming to Winston-Salem. I feel you. All right, so here's what we got. 11 minutes left in the show. Roddy has a hard out. Do you want to jump into Rod Stradamus now, or do you yeah. want to run through some of the Okay, let's do it. Well, which, which one do you want to do? Because we can Rod quick. I got my list. I just I I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to quickly touch on these guys. Because I can we can Rodster quick. I got my list. I just I, I just want to quickly touch on these games like for Saturday and Sunday. You can give me some rapid fire takes on these if you want. Eighth ranked Penn State at West Virginia. Dangerous. Dangerous. Fox. I dangerous. Agree. It'd be more dangerous if it was at night. But I still think that's a dangerous game. 
uh, Penn State having to play on the road at a West Virginia team that's plucky. Okay, they're plucky. Look, um, and Neil Neil Brown's a little Neil Brown's a little pissed. Like he's upset that they're not considered one of the favorites in the Big Twelve, and I can see why. Now it's muddled, but but like I can see why. He's got a quarterback coming back that's really good. He's got a team coming back that's really motivated. They had a really good year last year. That offense looks like it could take a step forward. So, uh, like, I don't disagree with him on on why he thinks they should be good. They should be great running the football. They've got all their running production basically coming back. Like, I don't disagree with him. Penn State generally good at stopping the run, but, like, new offensive coordinator, new defensive coordinator, you know, can they score with West Virginia? Can they handle that scenario, that, 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 that environment? I don't know. We'll see. South Dakota State at Oklahoma State. This like game this is one, this game is not on cable. It's only streaming on ESPN Plus. Great job, Brett Yormark. Uh, FCS versus FBS, and I I think the Jackrabbits could pull this upset. Man, Pokes got to watch out. I feel like North Dakota State and South Dakota State both being on someone's schedule week one is like a misstep by because like schools don't schedule these two teams with good reason it's kind of a lose-lose game you you win and, and you should have won you lose and you lost to an fcs team despite the fact that they're the back-to-back national champions south dakota state yes they're going to be very good but they did lose a lot of receiving production they lost an nfl running back in isaiah davis they lost an nfl um an nfl guard like they've they've, they've lost some legitimate pieces but mike Kosicki's back it's a good program. Jimmy Rogers does a great job. Um, this will be a tough game for Oklahoma State, particularly if they turn the ball over. Oklahoma State should be fine. They should be fine. Um, but you can't F around and find out. Like you, you have to go out there and establish yourself. And honestly, the way Oklahoma State wants to play, running the football with Ollie Gordon, they have to be able to – that's the way South Dakota State wants to, to beat you. Like They want to beat you with physicality. If they can establish Ollie Gordon, game's over. Like, done. You've beaten South Dakota State at their game. Blouses. But if not, if you have to throw the ball a little bit, if Alan Bowman turns the ball over, then you got issues. 3.30 on ABC, Miami at Florida. Look, I, I just, both of these teams, both of these head coaches absolutely have to have this game. Now, not because Crystal Ball is on the hot seat to the extent that Billy Napier is, Roddy, but... Dude, like, if you're Florida, I'm sorry. You, you you have to have this game. You have to, and I don't know if they yeah. will. Cam Ward, first game as a Kane, stoked for this thing, 3.30. Don't know what I'm going to get, and I'm excited to watch it. I am too. Um, the danger for Miami is that you get a little bit of what happened with Florida State. Like, that is, this, that is the worry, is that you have a group of guys. They don't have as many transfers, but you have a couple of guys that aren't quite sure on how this thing is going to work. I mean, Cam Ward's never played in a game this big. I don't. You can throw Correct. the apple cup. You can throw the apple cup at me, and I will throw it right back in your face. Like the people at Washington or Washington State don't care like the people in Gainesville. I can assure you of that, one thousand percent. Like the ball's different down here in the southeast. He hasn't played in a game like this. Damian Martinez has not played in a game like this. You can throw the Civil War at me, and I will throw it right back in your face. It's not called the Civil War anymore. Allegedly. Yeah, it's the war between the states, obviously. <laughs> I'm just saying. You know, it's, it's, we got it. 2024, we just got to make what sure. What is it called? Have... I thought it was like the Civil Conflict, maybe? or the war. I, I, it's not the war. It's like it's the, the Red war. River rivalry. It's not the shootout anymore. It's the rivalry. It's not the shootout in a while. Well, you know, you know, the whole... for, for, for some, it always is. I'm, I'm absolutely with you, man. The swamp's going to be berserk. That place is going to be jumping. Yeah, that's the word. Miami lose... should be fine, but, yeah. but like those are the things that you can't account for. And then the nightcap, A&M at Notre Dame. Or excuse me, vice versa, Notre Dame at A&M. That's going to be awesome. It is going to be awesome. And Notre Dame, they're walking into a bit of a bus. I do not like no, I do, I do not like this for Notre Dame. I do not like this for Notre Dame at all. I don't. New quarterback who's never played in an environment like that. It's a who's school playing that against his head coach from last playing year. Against his former head coach, which I don't think is a huge deal, but I think it's a deal. Um, Notre Dame also is not accustomed to playing in in environments like this. Like they can tout the pump their chest and we play big games. We play, yeah, sure. You don't go to A and M on the road regularly. Like they don't go to big stadiums on the road. No, they, they played they, at Ohio State a few years ago. But they, like, they do what they're doing with Tech this year, which is like, yeah, we'll play you at your place at the NFL stadium in your town. That's and also like because you have five ACC schools on your on your schedule every single year. Like you are playing a lot at Georgia Tech, not A and M. You're playing a lot at Wake Forest, not A and M. At Duke, 
Not A and M at Louisville. Not A and M. Like true or false, Roddy? True or false? If Notre Dame wins at Kyle Field on Saturday night, you will be chanting A C C A C C A C C. You got to claim them, right? False. Okay. False. No. Right. If they make the, the college football playoff, we will. But do you have Saturday off because you're doing the yeah. Thursday game? Yeah, dude, yeah. that's awesome. Good for yeah. you. Just pop yeah. on the Blitz. Just pop on the Blitz. Mute your TV. I will take care of you, dude. For Thank 12 you. Hours. I, I probably will. Um, the issue is that like the family doesn't doesn't get it. They don't get what these. I don't have Saturdays off, so they don't get what Saturdays are like when when we're home. Like they're not going to love the setup that's set up in the in the living room or the sunroom. They're not going to love the fact that dad's not super responsive for most of the day. They're not okay. going to love that. Well, you you had all summer, girls. Like th- th- this is dad's time now. Okay, I mean, I just let's, let's just it'll let's love just that. It. They're well, not super excited about that. Dad gets one day a week. This is that day. So usually I'm not here. I think I'm going to I think I'm going to do the pretend I'm not here thing. Like, girls, love you. I do. I love you to life. As Deion Sanders says, Coach Prime says, uh, but like pretend I'm not here. Pretend I don't exist. Girls, that's Graham Mertz, and we're about to watch him chuck it around the yard for the next three and a half hours, okay? All right, let's let me, get to, let me let's tell get you to some Rodstradamus. Let's right. get to some Rodstradamus. You're coming off a one and two week. Yeah, it sucks. So we reload and we yep. fire on week two. Hit me. But you know, you know one, I gotta have pardon. you know I gotta have skin in the game every day of the week. So uh so we're going Thursday first. Uh I've got one for Thursday. Give me UNC minus the points at Minnesota. Uh, can we lock in this number, Trip? I'm seeing one and a half. I just want to make sure. Two. That... I also see two, but I'll take one and a half. All right, one and a half. We'll give you one and a half. Thursday night lights. Ski you ma. Row the boat. Yep. Sink Row the boat. the boat. Ski you ma. Uh, on Friday, I don't love the Friday slate. TCU um, at Stanford? What's not to love? I, I That's the one I settled on. Uh, give me Stanford plus the points. Oh, okay. gross, Roddy. <laughs> What are you doing with that sound? Why, why not take Oklahoma and just lay 40-something against Temple? That too seems like points, a lot. Bro. Too many is points. it, though? Is too it? Many points. It's too many points. Stanford's a fishy line. I kind of like Stanford, too. Stanford hey, plus nine and a half. Back of locks. Mm-hmm. Plus nine and a half for the Cardinal. All right. Saturday is loaded, man. I mean, it, yep. just fire away. Like, what do you like? Um, so first and foremost, this is somewhat an emotional hedge, but kind of think that this is going to happen. Give me Georgia state plus the points against Georgia Tech. I think that's a great pick. Thank you. That's a great pick. Uh, don't know who's coaching Georgia state these days. Del McGee. Okay. Former running backs coach at Georgia. I mean, who? (sighs) big turnover at Georgia state. Like there, it's a lot of new there. Georgia Tech's coming off the big win. Georgia Tech wins, but I think it's like a 17 point win. Like I, I don't think I don't think they blow them out. I think it's a I think it's a refocus kind of game. I think it could be another low possession game. Uh, so I'll take Georgia State plus the points. Okay. Um, give me Clemson plus the points. Really? Yes, and the under. I would. Uh, I won't take the under, but I like the under. Clemson plus thirteen and a half. I yep. I I think that game gets out of hand, but we'll see. That's fair. We'll see. Um, I'll also take West Virginia plus the points. It's a lot. It's like nine and a half, I believe. Maybe it's I come saw down eight a and a bit. half, but yeah. but so it's it's starting to come down. We'll take nine and a half. I accept it. Uh, no, you will get eight and a half. Yeah, the line is eight oh, and a half. That's BS. Okay. Um, the other ones I like: uh, Texas A and M minus the points. It's like a three point line there. Okay. Yep. Miami minus the points. Yeah, you don't love your, it. You, I mean, you're just putting your faith in Mario Cristobal way too soon. Way too right. soon, but you're high on Miami. I've I heard you talking about them in Charlotte. You like the Canes. I like, I like if I'm gonna be as in on the Canes as I am, I'll take that. Uh, the other two that I like give me LSU minus the points, four and a half on Sunday half. night. Yep. And I'll take Virginia Tech minus the points. At really Miami. interesting. It's a sleepy, sleepy, interesting game, man. Sleepy, interesting game. Not because I think Virginia Tech is gonna lose. But I am excited to see what uh, what Vanderbilt looks like with their new everything, new yeah. offense, new quarterback. New I do too. Yeah, the quarterback coach. coming over from new from uh, New Mexico, who the one who peed Pavia. on the yeah, Diego the one Pavia. Who, New Mexico State who peed on the the New Mexico logo and all that stuff. Uh, Guy's a gamer. He's gritty. That's what you love. Yeah. To, that's, that's what you He's love gr- to see. He gives gamer. zero. He gives zero f's. By uh, the way, I, I can confirm that they 
Vanderbilt football stadium is no longer under construction. So there's oh, good. It, so. it is. I, I can uh, also confirm there's going to be about 40,000 Hokie fans there on Saturday. So yeah, by the time we do this again, uh, Boston college, Florida state will have played. I don't know which way to go with this line. I am tempted to take Florida state minus the points. It's cheap price on the Knowles. Mm, what's the, what's the line it's now? Cheap enough. Yeah, I don't know if it's cheap enough either. 16 like, if it was and like, a half. It was 13 and a half, maybe 16 and a half. That's, I have I'll no just, interest in Florida just stay State. Stay away, at that Roddy. Just stay away. I'm going you know? to stay away from Monday. Smart I'm going to stay away from Monday. Smart play. All right. So, Rod Stradamus has spoken. Week one lines have been, uh, have been set. We are going to be back on Wednesday here. Uh, Wayne Cook, Phil Steele will join me. We'll run through some more games. Trip Hurd will be alongside Phil Steele and Kyle Schasberger for the Phil Steele show on Thursday. And then we got our man Michael Felder on Friday. Just a casual four shows a week. No big deal. That's how we roll Easy. here on CSN. Light Roddy, work. safe travels to Colorado, buddy. Have a great Thank call. You. Looking forward to watching you. I know, I know you're going to come strong with the tie clip. So enjoy yourself in Boulder, okay, buddy? I actually don't have a tie clip right now. I lost mine last year, so I got to I gotta get a new one. Bro, go to Burlington Co. Factory, man. Get you a new one, dog. <laughs> okay. Is that place still go. open? Yeah, I think so. Maybe. Thank maybe. you to John Height from The Roar in Clemson for joining us for Trip. For Hot Rod, I'm Hartzell. We out. Go Jackets.